What is philosophy anyway? The word philosophy is perhaps most commonly used to denote an individual or group's general outlook on or approach to living life. For example, live and let live is a philosophy easily attributable to Jeffrey Lebowski, aka the dude, in the 1998 comedy classic The Big Lebowski. The dude is an iconic and beloved character precisely for his laid back live and let live approach to life. Man, things are complicated, the dude says, throwing back another white Russian. Fuck it, let's go bowling. The dude's philosophy here doesn't need to be rigorously defined. He's not going to write a dissertation on his dudeliness, and neither are most of us ever going to feel the need to formalize and elaborate at length on our basic life's outlook. But that doesn't and shouldn't stop us from nevertheless adopting and freely talking about our philosophy in this common, colloquial sense of the word. And then there's capital P philosophy. Philosophy is a subject you may study or even major in at university. Here we encounter philosophy as both its own autonomous field with a variety of subdivisions, including ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, ontology, axiology, and aesthetics, as well as a common subfield within other strictly non-philosophical areas of study. For example, a law school may offer courses in philosophy of law. Likewise, it's not uncommon for universities to offer, and in some cases require non-philosophy majors to take courses in philosophy of education, philosophy of literature, philosophy of religion, or philosophy of science. And for those of us who choose to major in philosophy at university, there may be different options for an area of focus or specialization, like the history of philosophy, or social and applied philosophy, or perhaps ethics. Bioethics has in fact become an increasingly common and popular area of specialization in universities around the world. But what about between these two? Is there another sense to the word philosophy that's neither the generic expression of a person's general attitude towards this or that aspect of life, nor the institutionally entrenched academic discipline that is best known for not leading to a job? In fact, it is part of what I believe is the crisis of contemporary philosophy that there is precious little to be said for a non-academic yet thoughtfully developed philosophical project. Philosophy today is by and large held captive by the academic machine, as one of my professors recently referred to it. One of the many unfortunate consequences is that in today's world, anyone who wishes to be credentialed and recognizes a philosopher must pay to play. From the BA to the MA to the PhD, you are not an official lover of wisdom until and unless the increasingly costly academic machine has molded you into one. Fuck it, the dude would say. Let's just subscribe to some philosophy podcasts and save our money for bowling and white Russians. Or for those of us struggling to get by in today's zero-sum economy, for medicine and rent. In a country where 45 million people are collectively saddled with more than one and a half trillion dollars in student loan debt, and where an education in philosophy can cost anywhere from 50 to $150,000 and maybe even more, it's no wonder the question, what is philosophy, elicits mostly only befuddled smirks, and that the task of articulating philosophical outlooks that are relevant to everyday people falls to the dude, since today's official card-carrying philosophers are too often being run dogged on the hamster wheel of the academic machine, beholden to the dictates of market-oriented university priorities. The core conviction of this podcast is that philosophy fails insofar as it remains either silent on or totally detached from the question of the art of a life worth living. Because of the inaccessibility of academic philosophy, whether owing to the monetary costs of training or the impenetrability of the professionalized vocabularies and standards it adopts, philosophy must, and inevitably will, break free from its captivity to the academic machine. And perhaps the most useful agent of this jailbreak, to the extent that it is already occurring, is so-called new media. 
Between new media and, I would add, with some qualifications, new spirituality movements, varieties of philosophical thought are undergoing a distinctively populist rebirth. Here, philosophy can be understood as insisting on a return to its oldest etymological meaning, the love of wisdom. From the Hi-Fi Nation podcast, that's H-I-P-H-I, the Hi-Fi Nation podcast, I recommend it, which weaves philosophy together with narrative storytelling, investigative journalism, and sound design, to YouTube channels like School of Life and Philosophy Tube. There's a growing niche within new media for forms of philosophical reflection and creativity that are fundamentally grounded, both in terms of methods employed and content produced, in questions of distinctively popular and public concern. Similarly, the so-called new spirituality that has emerged in recent decades fits an analogous niche of producing media and literature that serves the idea and ideal of wisdom for a life well lived. Eclectic in its sources and ecumenical in its outlook, that is, emphasizing unity and universality over dogmatism and division, the new spirituality is mostly nourished, not by the Western philosophical tradition, but rather by a particular canon of teachings selected from the great world religions, especially in their more mystical forms, including Christianity, Taoism, and Buddhism. To the extent that philosophy as a distinctive tradition is separable from these venerable religious traditions, and it is, though certainly not absolutely, as we will see in later episodes of this podcast, the new spirituality, unlike Hi-Fi Nation and Philosophy Tube and projects like them, is not nourished by a specifically philosophical approach to questions of ultimate concern, but rather by what we may classify as wisdom traditions. Whether philosophy, as the love of wisdom, ultimately differs, and if so, how, from wisdom traditions, is a question that this podcast will have reason to return to on a regular basis. So, what is philosophy for the people? Philosophy for the people is both a challenge and an experiment. As a challenge, we stand with one foot inside of academia and one foot outside in the local community, challenging the norms of the academic mode of philosophizing either in a limited access classroom or in total isolation in an office or study or at a conference with other specialists, we challenge these modes of philosophizing by inviting members of academia to participate in a form of public philosophy. That is, in friendly, informal dialogues about issues that matter to everyday people and their communities. Experimentally, philosophy for the people also seeks to challenge traditional academic expectations regarding how philosophy ought to be practiced. In my personal experience, having had some unique exposure to the world of higher education both here in the United States as well as abroad in East Asia and Europe, there is no shortage of graduate students and professors alike who find themselves exasperated by the ever alienating demands of the academic machine, which has been known to effectively beat the love of wisdom out of many of those who pay to play in its competitive marketplace of ideas. Instead of competition, philosophy for the people seeks to foster philosophical cooperation. Instead of rote argumentation and technical analysis, philosophy for the people encourages creative experimentation, philosophical poetics, non-sequitur meanderings, and importantly, an ever-renewed admission of non-mastery and deep confusion about the whole point of it all. Now, I'm not saying that competitive rote argumentation and technical analysis is all that academically employed philosophers, like the one sitting across from me now, today's illustrious guest, who I will introduce <laughs> in a moment. I'm not saying that that's necessarily descriptive of what they do as university philosophers. True, at its worst, this is what philosophy can and perhaps all too often is reduced to within the academic milieu. But at its best, and I am privileged to be a student in a very good philosophy department at Marquette University, all the salient qualities of philosophy that philosophy for the people seeks to engender, or at least most of them, are in one way or another built in to the curriculum of any university philosophy program worth paying tens of thousands of dollars to sign up for. I am here at Marquette studying social and applied philosophy precisely because of the philosophical richness of what goes on in the classrooms here. 
My professors are brilliant, passionate people who love what they do and are helping to shape me into someone who uh, one day will hopefully, perhaps, be deserving of the title philosopher. And yet, it is precisely one of the core convictions of philosophy for the people that all of us are perfectly capable of becoming bona fide lovers of wisdom and that we do not necessarily require the academic machine to see this inherent capacity realized. In fact, long before the academic institutionalization of philosophy, there were schools and communities of philosophical practitioners that met in public places to train together in the art of a life wisely lived. And that, friends, is what we're here to do today. This is Philosophy for the People, and I'm your host, Nathan Wiley, here with producer Nick Cook. Hello. Today's topic is philosophy as a way of life, and here to talk with us is assistant chair, not of philosophy, but of theology here at Marquette, Reverend Dr. Ryan Duns. Professor Duns, thank you so much for joining us for our first ever episode of Philosophy for the People. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Now, Professor, you're technically a theologian, but you work at the intersection of theology and philosophy, and you wrote your dissertation at Boston College on spiritual exercises, specifically as described by 20th century French historian of philosophy, Pierre Hadot. Now, I want to ask you about what it was that drew you to Hadot's work on spiritual exercises and what exactly he means when he talks about spiritual exercises. But before we dive into Hadot, uh, looking at your bio on the Marquette website, it seems that part of what drew you to reflect on spiritual exercises in philosophy is their capacity to reawaken a sense of transcendence. What is meant by this word transcendence in your thought and in your work as a hybrid philosopher, theologian, and member of the clergy? And what would be the significance for communities and individuals in reawakening a sense of transcendence? especially considering that we are now living in a country where depression, mass shootings, suicide rates, and what some have labeled diseases of despair like alcohol and drug addiction are all on the rise? That's a great question, and I'm glad that you've asked it. So my interest in Hado arises because of a nettlesome problem I, I ran into with the philosopher I'm most interested in named William Desmond. Desmond is a like Hado, a figure of great erudition, and he has written a tremendous amount, but he writes in a style that is at times almost impenetrable. And what I found with Hado was the key to unlock what was operating beneath the surface of Desmond's work, which is as I was reading Desmond, I was finding myself seeing the world, that my, my capacity for, trans, for perception was being transformed. And I didn't see a different world, but I began to see the world differently. And I saw the world more vibrantly. My capacity for attention was increased. And I saw Hado as a great interlocutor, as someone who could help me make sense of what Desmond was up to in his work. And then to, to flip that, to help, try to help people understand how, why they should be reading Desmond. Because, you know, unlike, say, Jean-Luc Marion or Martin Heidegger or Paul Ricoeur, um, Martha Nussbaum, Desmond is, is as yet an, a, a lesser-known figure. Now, what does this matter? Well, what I found in Desmond was a thinker who was very keen as a metaphysician to think about the question of transcendence. The word metaphysics... I mean, you could go into the Aristotelian you know, background of what it meant to be after physics or what, whatever. But Desmond will point out that the, the Greek meta can, has two meanings. It can mean among and it can mean beyond. Mm. For Desmond, his metaphysics arises amidst beings mm. and willingly raises the question of what is beyond being, a question of the transcendent. Mm -hmm. So to your, to your question, what do I mean by transcendence? I, I mean it in a few ways. Transcendence is, first off, that which is beyond the self, that second sense of meta, beyond. Transcendence is an action of self-transcendence. So if the first type of transcendence is exterior to ourselves, 
The second type of transcendence is moving beyond the self. The third type of transcendence as a theologian is the one I'm often most interested in because it's the one I pray to. Mm -hmm. Desmond would call that actual transcendence, the creative and sustaining source of all that exists. Now, people would say, well, that's, you know, very nice, but what difference does this make to anybody? Well, I think it makes an enormous difference. If you read someone like a Charles Taylor and you read about the, the buffered self, the self that has been somehow closed off from a, the, the question of God, of higher purpose in the world, of a telos or a, a goal, I am of a mind that this contributes enormously to the spiritual ennui of our age, to the rising rates of anxiety and depression and students who feel that their lives are meaningless. And so by approaching Desmond's metaphysics as a spiritual exercise or just approaching philosophy as a spiritual exercise, I think it is possible to reawaken within individuals a sense of something more, at least a sense of, say, self-transcendence toward a good. Iris Murdoch, for instance, would, would you know, cop onto that well enough, or toward God in the case of Charles Taylor and Desmond or any of the theological philosophers that you might see. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned Charles Taylor and uh, this idea of the buffered self. Does he write about that in A Secular Age? It is. That would be, that's the place where he's, he's most uh, explicit about this. You see it, not, not at, I mean, more sub subdued in uh, Sources of the Self, but in, in A Secular Age, you're getting the, his narrative you know, he raises the question at the beginning, I think it's like page 25, uh, why was it possible in the year 1500, like that belief in God was unquestioned, but in the year 2000, it's now up for debate. What? And he's trying to look at this epical shift in the way what you call the modern social imaginary, the way we live and move and act, or you know, if you want to be Heideggerian, comport ourselves within the world, and that how that has changed over time. And one of the major, major things is how we see space and time um, has been closed in on ourselves. So that he'll call it the imminent frame, but that imminent frame is not porous or open to the transcendent. It's actually, it's, it's, it's kept out. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's like being trapped in an elevator spiritually for people. And I, my suspicion, pastorally at least, is that the, the anxiety of our age is the claustrophobia, that we're just so mm. hemmed in. Mm -hmm. And we've got, it seems, nowhere to go. That's interesting. Now, and you mentioned, um, I'm not sure if it was in your reading of Desmond or in your reading of Haddo, that just by reading, you experienced a, a kind of transformation in the way you felt and perceived the world. It's interesting because Haddo uh, makes this point about ancient philosophy, that that's the whole point of philosophy is a, a kind of self-transformation. And it's interesting that you sort of underwent this by reading Desmond or Hedo or maybe both. Well, certainly, you know, it's funny, I, autobiographically, I was in Austria studying German for a summer, and on the street I met a fellow Jesuit who mentioned William Desmond and simply said, I'm studying his metaxological metaphysics. <clears throat> I went home and I did what every rational person does. I Googled it. <laughs> and I woke up that night, and this is in 2011, 2012, and I knew that that's what I had to study. Just from the Wikipedia little article, mm -hmm. I, there was something about this word metaxological that arrested my imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, reading Desmond, I trying to break into him and figure this post-Hegelian, Hegelian thinker who's open to God and writes on everything, I had to fi figure out how to make sense of him. So I read and reread and reread and banged my head against it. And then I picked up Hado, and all of a sudden, everything made sense. It's, it, you know, St. Paul had the scales fall from his eyes. I had a similar experience. I said, mm -hmm. oh, William, I get what you're up to now. Mm -hmm. His his roots are so deep. He's so well steeped in that philosophical tradition, but it's not a game for him. It is. I, mean, I think what's brilliant about Desmond is it, 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 what he writes is who he is. It's his beautiful Irish style of philosophy. He reads almost like James Joyce at times. Mm. 
But with Hado's lens, I got it. I think I got it. And I said, oh, I can make sense of you. And I can, I can help other people by inviting them into what you were doing. And so that, that's been kind of my work for the last two years is mm -hmm. making that explicit. Wow. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, one of my favorite th things about philosophy, in fact, probably the single most important thing about philosophy for me, probably why I do it, is for its therapeutic value. And it was refreshing to read in Hado uh, about the ancients. And I had read the ancients before, but I had never had it framed quite the way Hado frames it. Uh, and he emphasizes in the decades of his work on ancient philosophy that philosophy first and foremost presents itself in ancient philosophy as a therapeutics or as an art of living that cures illnesses by teaching a radically new way of life. What about philosophy in antiquity was therapeutic? And does philosophy today retain any of that therapeutic value that it once had at its point of origin? Ugh. So if I wish it did, I wish it did. You know, I, here at Marquette, we can get kids to sign up for exercise physiology and train, you know, we have a new gymnasium type of thing where they, they can test, you know, weights and how you hold the weights because it's practicable and they can measure it and manage it. It's a way of, of physical life. And unfortunately, I don't think philosophy has done that. We've betrayed that. It was Victor Goldschmidt's line that Hado likes to quote, the ancient philosophy was meant to form, not inform. Mm -hmm. And we and we have lost that. We we associate good philosophy now with how much do I know? Or how can I make an ironclad argument? Or how can I defeat my opponent? And that's not to say that ancient philosophy didn't have that. But, but we've lost that sense of, was it in the Lockies that Plato um, will write of, of talking about, this is talking of Socrates, that arguing with Socrates was like being you know, thrown basically into the wash, being into the river and being tumbled around and tumbled around and not knowing which way you come back out. But you know you're better for it. And there was ancient practices of philosophy. And, and Hado will mention that you have ethics, like how, what is it good to be? There's logic, the rigorous pursuit of the truth and, the fit, and physics, an openness to wonder. I mean, I teach, I teach a 1001 introduction to theology course. And if I say, who likes physics? They're all going to... I mean, they, they get what gravity is and F equals MG. And I was a chemistry major, so I get it. But the idea of physics as being open to wonder or, you know, or astonishment or physics as capacitating some form of cosmic vision is almost wholly lost because we've siloed off all of these academic disciplines. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it seems to me that the practices of ancient philosophy adapted for the 21st century, not unlike the ways of theology, which obvious, I mean, for and Hado's account, Christian theology kind of puts the kibosh on the ancient practices of philosophy, but in a Hegelian way, sort of subsumes them into itself and makes, you know, the Christianity as a way of life. That I think these are going to be two of the disciplines, uh, if we're, if we're to stave off entering into this weird post-humanistic age, that we're going to need because these are the arts of living human life. We need that. Yes, uh, I agree a hundred percent. And it's interesting that you brought up uh, these different uh, top boy or areas of study and application of philosophy that Hedo uh, sort of elaborates for us in his book, Philosophy as a Way of Life. And those were, as you mentioned, logic and ethics and physics. But the point that Hedo makes is it's not as though uh, ethics was just one category. There was an ethics involved in the physics. There was an ethics involved in the logic. And in fact, while they did have a theoretical component to them, that theoretical component was actually subordinated to the practical or lived component. Physics was a lived physics. Logic was a lived logic. Um, and so... In the eyes of ancient philosophy, you emphatically weren't a philosopher if you concerned yourself only with the theoretical discourses and neglected the most important part, the spiritual exercises. And you mentioned that today, that's pretty much what philosophy consists of, is the uh, theoretical exercises. Yeah, we talk the talk and we don't always walk the walk. And that's I mean, when you think of like, the ancient philosophers as peripatetic and wandering, that's been, that's been lost. I mean, we do philosophy... By walking into a classroom and walking out, we write articles 
no one reads. I think that's deeply problematic. But we, our, our era academically, I mean, we, we suffer from, I mean, philosophers and theologians, we suffer from footnote envy. Like we have adopted the canon uh, of measurement that says, in order to be a reputable scholar, you have to have a certain, you know, employ a certain scholarly apparatus and make a certain type of argument. And people look askance at asking them to undertake or undergo some type of experience. So, for instance, you could take a thinker, a theologian like Karl Rahner. And Rahner in the 1930s and 40s, you know, particularly in the 40s, he's writing these, these what we would consider spiritual exercises and talk about his, the experience of being uh, in, in Germany during bombing raids. And he will basically invite people to imagine what it is like to be within the, a rubbled over cellar where they've taken refuge from the bombing. And what that's like, and what, did it, what is it to expend oneself and trying to escape the confines only to find oneself alone and bargaining with God and falling silent and then realizing in that moment oh, an encounter with authentic transcendence, the Holy One, who has been there the whole time listening and loving, to, loving you. Now, not all philosophers would want to go that way, but Rahner has no problem inviting people to use their imagination to enter into a different type of experience. That's that is that's dangerous territory for a lot of thinkers who will say that's spirituality, that's self-help, that's not rigorous philosophy. When in fact they mark the betrayal of authentic, the authentic roots of philosophy. So there's an ironic, you know, twist in all of this. Well, there is definitely, you know, in the analytic philosophical tradition, there is a almost fetish of thought experiments. But there are different kind of thought experiments, yeah. aren't they? They are. I mean, it, 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 you, it, John Searle is good for the, the thought experiment. And I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Wittgenstein or brain in the vat type of things. But they're, I want to say logic puzzles, but they're still abstracted. They're taken from daily life, but what's the grasp? Where do they grip the world we live in? They're not intended to transform our vision. Mm. You know, and, that for, and that for Hado is vital. It's the cultivation of a cosmic awareness. To stand above, you know, and you hear he'll talk about Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. You know, here you have the, the emperor who's writing what, you know, look like random scraps, more or less excessively written fortunes from uh, Chinese cookies. But what Hado had the insight, and he wasn't the first, but that they were hyponomata, that they were these you know, little exercises that he could revisit day after day as practices. And when you read them accordingly, they make tremendous sense um, to, to remind us that we are going to die. Or uh, you may have picked this up in your own reading. Uh, you've seen the movie The Silence of the Lambs. Yes. You know, there's the movie when Hannibal Lecter says to Clarice Starley, uh, Marcus Aurelius, Clarice, uh, first principles, what is the thing in itself? And it, that's kind of a throwaway line, but it's not a throwaway line. That's the method of decomposition. Mm -hmm. That's Marcus Aurelius looking at things we take for granted, like sex. I'm a priest. I don't have sex. But if I did, I bet it's good. And I know a lot of people have it because there's lots of people around. So, they're, you know, they're having sex. Well, he's like, look, we go crazy about sex. Like, we're driven by it. But what's sex? It's, it's friction and some goo. I think it's his way of putting it. I yeah, mean, well, it's great. Let me read that because it is in a particularly important passage um, and one of interest. And Hado quotes it. We're talking about Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of the Roman Empire, a Stoic philosopher in the first century. Uh, he wrote a book called The Meditations. And in it, he writes, just like your bathwater appears to you, oil, sweat, filth, dirty water, all kinds of loathsome stuff. Such is each portion of life and every substance. These foods and dishes are only dead fish, birds and pigs. This wine is just a bit of grape juice. This purple-edged toga is some sheep's hair dipped in the blood of shellfish. As for sex, it's the rubbing together of pieces of gut, followed by the spasmodic secretion of a little bit of slime. <laughs> and this is the, and that's the industry that drives the advance of the internet. <laughs> now, now Hadel, uh, he he makes it a point that some have misread 
uh, Aurelius as being just uh, pessimistic about life. Right. But that's not what he's actually up to in these meditations, is it? No, I think this is, it's tremendously life affirming. You, you know, you, at the very beginning, you mentioned the, the question of anxiety. That, and that's a pressing issue. Among college students, we're seeing upwards of 60% in some studies are, are reporting excessive anxiety. Well, how do we treat this? Well, we, of course, you can give them pills or you can train them up in practices where they start to, say, employ this method of decomposition. And they look at the, the matters pressing them and say, wait, I can exercise control over this. Let's look at the, let's break it down in, into its constitutive elements. What is it in itself? Okay, it's an assembly. I can tackle each one of these on its own. It's not so scary after all. What seemed very difficult and problematic at the beginning becomes much easier to manage. One transcends it, stands above it, takes a cosmic view, not the Archimedean point, not up in the Empyrean surveying, you know, from like the, the view from nowhere, but to stay engaged with reality, but have a sense of being above reality at the same time. Again, that, that there, there's the, the fulfilling the promise of a good metaphysics beginning amidst beings, and then knowing that there's something beyond them. But to have a view of that, it is enormously therapeutic. And that, I can only say that, I was with two students today, and this is the exact conversation we had. Practices of mindfulness, con con contemplative prayer, aimed at helping to ameliorate these senses, the sense of anxiety that they face mm -hmm. through practices. Or yeah. as we as Prado, spiritual exercise. Yeah, a well-defined spiritual exercise here, that of decomposition or physical definition. It has a number of different applications uh, from helping to alleviate anxiety. Uh, Aurelius used it to sort of dispel the false conventional judgments of value that people express concerning objects and in doing so to disarm them of the power they have over us. So this robe, this toga... It's a, a sign of wealth and power, but really it's just cloth, cheap's, cheap's wool dipped in uh, shellfish, yeah. the blood of shellfish. Right? So it, it, they, you divest them of their sort of illusory power. And we live in a highly commodified world, too, where we're totally surrounded by these uh, enticing objects. And so when you really apply this method of decomposition, uh, you can maybe disarm them of some of the force they have over you, so that force might actually be contributing to your anxiety as well. Um, I had another thought too about a different uh, way in which this particular spiritual exercise could, could be applied, but it's, it's in my mind. You know, one, if I may, uh, what one thing as well that Marcus Aurelius will enjoin as you know, Seneca and Epictetus is this the, imagine, the awareness of our mortality. You know, uh, Plato famously observed that philosophy is the preparation for death. It teaches us how to die. Marcus really takes us quite seriously. I mean, and the ancients do as well. That, but it, it confronts us with our mortality, and that begins to relativize the things that we hold of value. I mean, I, Jean-Luc Marion, the French phenomenologist, has great insights into icons and idols, but we are an, we are an idolatrous people. What is it that you love? That is what you worship. And so, I mean, I don't worship at the shrine of the Kardashians, but they have their own show. Or cars, or fashion, or the body, or wealth and power. I mean, who are our celebrities today? Well, Hado picks up on this. And in, in, another, in, in the wake of this, one of the Christian iterations would certainly be, well, the Desert Fathers and Mothers, but St. Ignatius of Loyola where you have, you know, as part of the spiritual exercises, how do we discern who we are called to be in this world? How do we make a good dis informed decision? Let me imagine myself on my deathbed. What is the decision I would be happy to have made? Or in the more Christian iteration, as I stand before the last judgment, how will I want to answer for myself? Again, it is never a denying the flux, but it is to, to elevate momentarily from the flux to examine, examine one's life vis-a-vis -vis it. That's, I mean, that's, that's a level of attentiveness that, that we simply lack 
very often. So here and now, instantaneous, we want to react and respond. The Twitter effect. I mean, I think Marcus Rios has a great deal to teach us. Indeed. And, and really, philosophy as a discipline, one of its, uh, for all of its um, flights into abstraction, it does bring perspective. And uh, simply having perspective sometimes is enough to calm us, your calm yourself. And really, that is enough for the Stoics anyway. That is a transfer. A transformation has taken place if you are calmed and you regain your bearing and you gain a certain sense of control uh, over, uh, you can exercise a certain amount of control over yourself that, other, that uh, otherwise you might not have. I thought of the other uh, possible application for this uh, spiritual exercise of decomposition or physical definition. And that is, you know, I'm reading Emmanuel Levinas now, mm. and he talks about people having an allergic reaction to the other, you know, to people who aren't like us. And we certainly live in a moment where that is very much the case. Um, now, if you sort of examine that disgust, like, why is it that I'm having this reaction to this otherness and break it down into its elements? Uh, I think that method could go a long way in sort of um, helping you to understand it better. I wish I had the quote in front of me because I actually thought about this because of Giordano Bruno, who says at some point, like, that, you know, not anything that disgusted him, he would examine very carefully yeah. and he would define it. Uh, for exactly what it is, the kind of method that uh, Aurelius is using when he talks about sex as the rubbing together of two organs, you know? Yeah. And in just doing that, you disarm it of its uh, force. And so I think that is a, a kind of exercise I think that could be useful in today's world. No, I think you're right. You know, I'm thinking now of, so the, there's a philosopher, I think he taught Wellesley, um, Noel Carroll. And he wrote a book in the 1990s, The Philosophy of Horror. And he'll describe, why does horror work? And his contention, it's a cognitive approach he takes. Say, so, listen, horror novels, horror movies work because they play on the monster has to uh, be, uh, pose a danger and it must disgust. And part of what's monstrous, and, and Levinas picks up on this, is there can be category jamming. So... The, the other uh, brings together different color, shape, face, you know, feature, physical features, uh, or interstitiality. We don't have an extant set of schemas and categories for that other to fit into. And so it, it rocks us back on our heels, and we don't know what to do with it. I mean, so phenomenologically, in terms of a personal, it's having the, an awareness of this attentiveness to, oh, my goodness, I am being horrified or I'm being repulsed right now, instead of running with that feeling, I mean, to register it, but then to examine more deeply, why do I feel this way? Why, why when politician X speaks, do I recoil? What is it about this? Mm -hmm. Rather than just offering some platitude that we've picked up on talk radio, actually to examine our response and to more uh, refinedly focus on what is it that elicits this response mm -hmm. that i mean that's the the examined life that makes it worth living we know why we're undergoing these these reactions again you know like in twitter is not the place for this um dr connor kelly uh, one of my great colleagues in the theology department far smarter than i am Car connor and i are teaching a 1001 course to the first year students in theology, we build a spiritual exercise into every class session. We do some type of meditative exercise between three and five minutes sometimes. Mm. Uh, wow. On Mondays and Fridays, it can be upwards of 12 to 15 minutes mm -hmm. in a 15 minute class. It's an enormous investment of time because we think that it is not enough. It, theology can't be, philosophy cannot be telling you about. It has to be an invitation for you to experience something, to examine your own life in light of your experience, integrating what it is that you are learning as you learn it, and try to appropriate it in an existentially viable way. What would be an example of the kinds of exercises you do in those classes? So one, you know, again, this is my Jesuit slip showing, we'll do a little meditation. So we start out, 
Now, you have to keep in mind, like, 230 restive undergrads getting ready. You know, it's it's 145, and they're ready to go. I do the, all right, everybody, if I can get you to put your feet flat down on the floor, sit up straight and close your eyes. We're going to take three deep breaths. In through the nose, two, three, four. Out through the mouth, two, three, four, five, six. In through the nose. Two, three, four, out through the mouth. Two, three, four, five, six. And so we begin in a spirit of gratitude. Recall something today that you are grateful for having experienced, big or small, it doesn't matter. Then turn your mind toward an issue that has been causing you anxiety a fear, maybe something you have stumbled over, a bad grade on a test, a fight with the roommate. Bring that to the forefront of your imagination and just examine it. After a few moments, I invite them. Many, many of our students do believe in God, so ask for God's help or simply ask for the light to see this as it is and for the strength to respond to it as it is needed for you to respond. And then we close. But I can get these 230 busybody students silent. And I'm not, a, I'm not an intimidating guy, and I, have a, I don't have a deep, burly voice. But my intuition is that they are deeply hungry for this. And last year I taught a course, thanks to Hado, um, called Contemplation and Justice in a Violent World. And I will offer it again, but that course I had 15 minutes of contemplation in every class. And we met only two days a week, so one hour of lecture discussion, but 15 minutes was in silence. And I had a, an alum of the class who came by to see me today just to tell me how it had changed her life. It's almost like um, the contemplative component has been sort of removed from philosophy. And that's a particularly useful component to reintroduce back into whether it's philosophy or, or uh, in any way that we can reintroduce it back into our lives. Because one effect it has is just simply to slow things down. And I think that's one of the most subversive things you can do uh, and the most therapeutic things you can do in a culture that increasingly values uh, high speeds ever increasing speeds, ever higher speeds and efficiency. People, when they get busy and backed up and say, and it's pretty much always, I mean, I ask them, well, when was the last time you were on top of things? And of course, they can't think of when you were last on top of things. It's impossible because you can never get on top of things in today's uh, rushed world. And so rather than speed up to catch up, you're never going to catch up. I always like to tell people, slow down. If yeah. you want to get on top of things, the best thing you can do uh, off the bat is to slow down. That's brilliant. I think that's the only way to go. People, we don't need, I mean, 5G is great for your phone, but I don't think it's very great for the human heart and I, or the human mind. We, we will never know everything, and this can be paralyzing. And I'm, I am privileged to be able to teach in a school where we can have conversations about about racism and prejudice and hate, where we can talk about the, the value of, or disvalue of faith and belief about God, God's existence, about the value of living a Christian life, if there is one, the, the, the problems and the potentials, the pitfalls and the promises. You know, um, that's taken, I, mean, I don't take that for granted, but that's, that, that's important here because that's missing in our world. That's not valued. And I, I think that's where finding in stillness, and, again, and whether, whether it, you, you're going to go with the good, Iris Murdoch, whom I'm deeply fond of, or like a Simone Weil, God, how, to what are you attentive? And, and how, how do you respond in, through that attentiveness to that woo, that magnetic pull, that call to your vocation? And that's really, that's, that's the challenge these students face. They have so many options. They all want choices. They're petrified of choosing. 
And it, it could also be just an attentiveness to yourself. And Hado talked, we talked about a, a couple of different spiritual exercises, the view from above, physical definition. And there's also the spiritual exercise of dialogue. And what dialogue, what Hado means when he talks about dialogue in the context of antiquity and philosophical practice is what he calls an exercise of authentic presence of the self to itself and of the self to others. And part of what this form of philosophical dialogue entails is actually a struggle with oneself because what you say is what you think and you sort of hold yourself open to criticism. You make yourself vulnerable uh, to maybe having to have a changed point of view or attitude or set of convictions, but just the attentiveness to what it is that you're saying, what words are coming out of your mouth, yeah. what are your convictions, and what are those of other people? That in itself can be to struggle, but it can be a very rewarding struggle and part of what it meant to be a philosopher for the, the ancients. Yeah. Well, you look at, I mean, when students kvetch about having to read, you know, Plato, I mean, if you read Plato, and I will admit, I was taught to read Plato. What is his argument? What is the point? Analyze the argument. It was because of Hado I could go back, and Hado and Murdoch I was reading simultaneously, you know, to go back and reread Socrates, not as offering some system, but of thinking through questions systematically and learning to dialogue. And then, you, and of course, you can read, David Hume is great at this too. Um, you can probably get it in Kierkegaard as well. Um, but these thinkers who are willing to enter into a dialogue, it was certainly Abelard and Erasmus, Erasmus maybe most beautifully, uh, but these thinkers who are, that, that it's not just telling you, but they're engaging you in a dialogue that is, that is clarifying both of your own under self-understanding and as you articulate it, you're contributing to the self-understanding of another. But that's not the way, I mean, we, we go into classes, it's debate. I mean, you're in graduate school too. Um, it, we t it's a winner-take-all mentality. Like, I have to be right. Like, I've got to, you know, plant my flag on the class hill today and say, like, I dominated. When in actuality, I think the goal for most instructors, and I think for most graduate students with any wherewithal, is no, let's do the process. Let's think this through. Like, how do we think with one another? But that takes trust. That takes mm -hmm. vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and these are and these are virtues today that are not in high esteem. Yeah, and you know, I was just um, in class um, with Professor Vandeveld, and he had just come back from a conference in Canada, in Montreal, I think. And he was speaking with a colleague, and he relays to the class that the colleague was lamenting that um, they would have to start grading students blindfolded, or, like. That is to say, you wouldn't know who the student was. So you, and Dr. Vandeveld made the point that you're more and more removing the element of trust from the student-teacher relationship. Yeah. And you know, unfortunately, that uh, that's also how philosophers are going to increasingly be evaluated, probably by algorithms who count how many footnotes you have and. <laughs> how well cross-referenced your work is and judge you based on that. But that would be a radical departure from uh, philosophy as it uh, practiced in antiquity. I mean, it's sad that the index of a great philosopher is how many citations you get as it, by other philosophers who are predisposed to liking certain philosophers. And if you hit the sweet spot or you write the right article, that's all you need. But what about the task of doing philosophy? That that vulnerability of standing in between not having any wisdom, we wouldn't seek it if we didn't have any, so having an intimation of, of desire for, to know and to love wisdom, and not possessing it fully. So we're always in this weird middle space, this journey, a pilgrimage, and it's our vocation as thinkers, it's the vocation of reason to press up against the limits of human rationality, and to invite people on this journey with us. And, you know, it, on this journey, um, a lot of the philosophers that Hedo is referencing, uh, many of them are Stoic or Epicurean. And the two Stoic philosophers that I think he most frequently 
sites. Well, it might be uh, three of them, Marcus Aurelius, mm -hmm. Seneca, and Epictetus. Mm -hmm. Epictetus actually wrote a manual for the journey. Yeah. And I wanted to read a quote from Epictetus from that manual uh, or handbook. Is Enchiridion? That's right, yes. yes. Oh, great. Good, good. And uh, here's what Epictetus thinks uh, is how a philosopher should behave and how a, a philosopher should be evaluated. He writes, well, he actually didn't write it. Probably one of his students jotted down these notes. Uh, but he says, never call yourself a philosopher and don't talk among laymen for the most part about philosophical principles, but act in accordance with those principles. And so you likewise shouldn't show off your principles to laymen, but rather show them the actions that result from those principles when they've been properly digested. And, you know, in terms of being able to properly digest, a Seneca will, will recommend reading fewer books. Not, it's not as though the, the more you read, the more well-read you are and the more uh, credentialed you are. No, Seneca says, just pick a few books. And make sure you digest them. And it's also how you, like what, here, um, you know, Epictetus produces a handbook. Uh, Seneca writes letters. These aren't, uh, they're not writing dissertations. They do write treaties. Mm -hmm. uh, Seneca wrote some <clears throat> treaties. Uh, but one of his great works is his letters to Lucilius. And here in, in these letters, he also has uh, some fantastic definitions of philosophy that are a little bit uh, of the philosopher, uh, rather, that are a little bit different than how we think about the philosopher today. And I'm just going to read one from letter 16, where Seneca says, shake yourself out. Check yourself over. Look at yourself in different ways. Above all, consider whether the progress you have made has been in philosophy or in life itself. Philosophy is not tricks before an audience, nor is it, thing, is it a thing set up for display. It consists not in words, but in actions. One does not take it up just to have an amusing pastime, a remedy for boredom. It molds and shapes the mind, gives orders to life and discipline to actions, shows what to do and what not to do. It sits at the helm and steers a course for us who are tossed in waves of uncertainty. Without it, there is no life that is not full of care and anxiety, for countless things happen every hour that need the advice philosophy alone can give. So, I mean, in summary, what distinguishes a true philosopher from an ordinary person and antiquity? You know, Hado writes that they're, that the, the philosopher's, of antiquity were distinguished by their moral conduct, by speaking their minds, by their way of nourishing themselves or dressing themselves, by their attitude with respect to wealth and conventional values, um, by their actions, not by their publications. So by contrast, how are philosophers today distinguished from everyday people? Oh, I think it's, it's who gets the hits on the YouTube channel or the most tweets. It's popularity. It's pithiness. It's not depth. You know, when you think of, um, was it Her uh, it's Heraclitus, the way up is the way down, that it's catabasis, the, the going down and leading to anabasis. Or in Plato's case, it's the ascent and then the, de the, the return descent back to the people, back to the, the ones who live in shadows. We, we've lost that sense of mission of philosophy as, as even a rescue operation. We now want, if it's measurable it's, and manageable, if it can count, if it can be counted, it counts. That's not the case. I, I, I think we've lost that uh, front-facing porosity to lived life. And that, you know, in what you read from Seneca, is absolutely the case. I think, look at yourself. And, you know, how, what, what type of progress are you making? Now, redouble your efforts. It's not a show. It's not how witty and clever the repost or the jab that you can throw. Let yourself, let your body, let your actions testify to you. Mm. Like that will be the living work. Mm -hmm. It's not, not the, the volume you wrote, pen and paper, but it's the volumes you're writing because you're interacting with people and making, you know, and transforming them in dialogue and through action. Absolutely. Yes. So, I mean, maybe just so we only have a couple minutes left, but as a concluding question, how can philosophy sort of break free from its current academic entrenchment? And, and what does Hado have to teach us about how that could be accomplished? 
I think Hado is vital for this endeavor. If we're going to not allow philosophy to fall into this fortress mentality that's you know fortified by footnotes, uh, what Hado is showing is a way of of doing rigorous philosophy that is faithful to its tradition, that is transformative, that is rigorously argued. I mean, if nothing else, you may disagree at points with him, but he's a rigorous thinker. He's read, it seems, everything. And he's in dialogue with a lot of people. But he's not writing to stay in his citadel. He is writing for the people because he wants this to be a way of life. And so I think that is... It is entirely possible. We have to reevaluate how we're teaching. Are we teaching? Do we teach a platonic dialogue simply to say what's the argument? And then do we go from like Plato to Aristotle and then we maybe bounce into something at Augustine? We do the five ways of Thomas Aquinas. We do some moderns and then we land in the morass of 20th century philosophy at some point. Or do we show why philosophy is compelling because it transforms the way we see the world? Mm-hmm. It's a, it leads in one of his phrases, a metamorphosis of the self. And you know, Christians will say that's the action of grace, that exercises pre- can dispose us to that. You know, you could take uh, Foucault has his ideas of, of you know, care of the self, technologies mm-hmm. of the self, and that's cool too. But for, but Hado does see this as as as, re- as as cultivating this cosmic awareness of of the of transcendence of stepping beyond oneself to see the self and to see the world with new eyes. He's writing for the people, as you uh, said. I like that very much. That's what we're trying to do here with this podcast. What is it to philosophize? In the last analysis, this seems to be Hedo's central question. And it is a question that we will return to again and again in this podcast. Once again, you've been listening to Philosophy for the People. Professor Duns, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great. If you enjoyed this discussion and would like to engage the topic in more depth, be sure to sign up for our free weekend seminar starting Saturday, September 5th. The seminar will be held online over a period of 14 weeks and is open to anyone. Just email philosophyforthepeople at gmail.com and you will be automatically registered to receive updates and weekly invitations to our online classroom. Again, that's starting September 5th. This has been a solid work production. Solid work. Solid work. Uh, Solid work. Hey, solid solid work. work.